Firstly, it's uh, great to be back here at uh, the Inkjet Conference. This was a fantastic event uh, last year, and we're very pleased to be uh, invited back. Um, my name uh, is Rick Hume, uh, as, as mentioned, and I'm the Global Sales and Product Manager, not only for this particular technology, but also for the UV products um, that uh, are represented both in the graphics and the, uh, the packaging and narrow web spaces. So just a little bit of an introduction to Sun Sunjet, uh, who we are. Um, we're uh, based in the UK, uh, but we have manufacturing facilities uh, in the UK, the US, um, and also with our parent for, um, DIC in Japan. And we serve the market globally from those uh, from those uh, facilities. Our R and D facility and all of this technology has been developed in the uh, in the UK. So um, we aim to supply inks into into the market. Sun Chemical, our parent, are one of the largest um, ink producers in the world, and uh, also uh, involved in uh, pigments and uh, uh, polymer science as well. And um, within that, we have a stated ambition and aim to deliver not only to the graphic sector, which has been particularly successful with inkjet, but also into packaging. Um, I think last week alone we saw that uh, Inkjet is now an accepted uh, technology in the, in the narrow web space. Um, we've been pioneering UV technology, of which the hybrid obviously forms part of uh, since the early 1990s. And throughout our uh, development as a business, we've always worked together with the, the system integrators, the OEMs. Um, that's particularly important for us because we can make the best ink chemistry in the world, but without the, uh, the systems to deliver it, it's kind of rendered useless. So what do we have? Um, we have aqueous technology um, for things like textiles, uh, publication, and today we'll cover some more on, uh, on packaging as well. Uh, UV, pretty well established. Last year I stood here and talked to the audience around low migration and we saw plenty of evidence of that last week at Labour Expo um, as that technology begins to be um, accepted into the marketplace. Today we'll cover uh, hybrid in some detail and the other uh, products are listed on there. I will not go through in any uh, level of detail. They're well established and well understood in the world of inkjet. What we do do uh, within our um, product portfolio is we work very closely with um, the R&D teams in the greater organization. So we're not just involved in the development of the inks, but also in the uh, principal raw materials as well. And that's led us to introduce things like low migration technology um, to the marketplace. But in addition to that, that sort of leads us on to, to the hybrid chemistry that we're going to talk about today. So firstly, I promised to tell you what it was. Um, it's Aquacure, that's our name for the uh, uh, hybrid technology that we have uh, developed. And that basically is a water containing um, ink. Uh, the majority of the, uh, of the uh, ink component is made up of water. And it addresses uh, two aspects. Whenever I speak to people, people always tell me that water is the, um, is the preferred solvent, if you like, um, for the purposes of print. Um, and they would love to do more with water. Um, however, there are some limitations in regards to that. But what water does deliver is it delivers the feel, the film weight, um, and the odour that uh, you expect and see day in, day out on your supermarket shelves. In addition to that, it helps in relation to health and safety. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a significant change in the uh, legislative landscape with respect to a lot of the materials used in 100% solid UV products. Um, so water uh, assists us in that regard. And the UV element still gives you this level of um, uh, performance in regards to its durability in terms of its addressability to a number and broad range of, uh, of media. In addition to that, the other risk with water, of course, is that it dries up in print heads. And as the presentation uh, explained before me, these heads are very intricate, very expensive. So therefore, um, the UV component is very good at keeping those nozzles open and keeping the head life um, for, the, for the long term. So what's the background to Aquacure? Um, what, have, what have we done and how have we developed it? How have we come to, to, to Aquacure? Um, effectively, uh, Sun Chemical, a number of years ago, um, identified that hybrid could be an interesting uh, technology for the 
um, for the flexographic market space um, for a number of reasons. One was around um, VOCs. Another aspect was cost control. Um, and again, compliance formed, formed part of it. So um, throughout that process, we developed a technology called WetFlex, um, which uh, has and continues to be used in the, in the market today. But we were able to take those principles and that 10 years of R&D and deliver it into, a, in, in, into an inkjet platform. So we've got a number of patterns which cover the traditional aspects of the uh, formulation. But in addition to that, obviously, we've been evolving this technology now for a number of years. And we've looked to uh, establish patent technology around um, photo initiators, for example, which allow for uh, final cure with, with LED systems, as an example. And what does a typical ink contain? Um, people often say to me, well, an aqueous ink, that could contain 5% water. As you'll see there, depending upon the print head and depending upon the application, it varies from between 60 to 90%. For us, anything in excess of 50%, we will classify as a, as a water-based ink. The other elements to it are pretty um, straightforward uh, products which are well established in, uh, in, in the inkjet world. So what does all this mean practically? Um, that basically aligns us now so that we have a truly functional aqueous product. The aqueous products that have been out there today have either delivered very good on-media performance or very good on-press performance. And combining the two has proved very, very difficult over a, a number of years and over a number of attempts. This product does require a dual cure system. So for that, you have to have a heat element and a UV element to attain a final printed, uh, printed film. It's very good in terms of keeping the, uh, the heads alive, as I, I touched on previously. Um, um, by that, I mean that if you have uh, an aqueous solution, where you 100% aqueous, where you evaporate the aqueous and you, the water and you leave the resin and the pigments, for example, um, once that's in a print head, it's going to be very difficult to remove. In this product, because it has that dual um, cure system, effectively, no matter how warm the print heads get, it's never going to fully cure. So you end up with a highly viscous material, which you can still remove from the print heads. So we found head life to be um, very good indeed. The hazard labeling I touched on. So today you'll see um, things like dead fish, dead tree logos, uh, the body silhouettes, um, as standard practice on 100% um, UV products. Um, these products will carry up worst uh, an explanation mark and in some cases will be uh, label label free the film weights a big uh, is a big one um, when you look in the in the market today and we were at label Expo or many of us were at label Expo last week and you look at the hundred percent solid systems you have a very good performance and you now have quality which I believe to be acceptable to the marketplace but when you walk around your supermarket there are certain things that are a given um, and the uh, general perception of the, uh, the package is that it's typically quite flat. Um, you don't tend to have too much in the way of structuring. So this product actually gives uh, the ability to deliver inkjet printed um, packaging with a similar, uh, similar output. And then finally, um, odour. Odour is again a given in the packaging sector, but it's not just packaging. Um, from a graphics perspective, for the last five, maybe even ten years, I've been asked, how are you going to get odor down in a UV base? This product has the ability to deliver that because of its water component and the ability to use different UV materials with it um, due, to, due to the water component. On the right-hand side, I will just point out this picture. Um, those of you who've uh, been involved in the market for a long period of time will have seen a number of uh, iterations of functional aqueous over the years. So um, one of the aspects to the aqueous UV that uh, is particularly exciting for us is the resolubility of it. So on the left-hand side, you have what typically would be classified as a, as a functional aqueous or latex type product. And you can see there that resolubility, uh, once it's been subjected to heat, um, it is not fantastic. And that's the sort of material which I'm sure any head manufacturers in the room or anybody who's running inkjet presses will block uh, print heads up. On the right-hand side, you'll see that it's uh, redispersing very easily, and therefore you're maintaining the life of the print heads for longer. So when we talked about cure, what does that actually look like? What do we mean by that? Um, most people will ask the question when you develop a, a unit, 
well, I want to jet it, and then I want to hit it with a UV, and then I have the drying station at the end. Um, reason being is that there are a lot of UV printers out there today, and therefore it'll be fairly straightforward to, to integrate. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that. So the order has to be the drying stage um, first, so you're evaporating the water and volatile component, and then you're curing afterwards. Um, and the reason behind that, in the left-hand side, you have a, a water component which is preventing the UV molecules from uh, effectively uh, cross-linking. So you have to remove that before you can even contemplate the process of, of cross-linking. So um, as we move down, the first stage is to um, evaporate. That could be IR or NIR. And then you go to the final stage, which will, um, which will involve a low-powered UV. So it's nowhere near as high-powered um, as you see today in the conventional UV world. What, in, what, does, what does all this mean? Um, the other aspect that we get asked a lot about is how are we going to control image quality? If we can't hit it with UV immediately, how are we going to prevent the products from uh, wetting out or reticulating and losing image quality? So this product is designed to thermally pin. So rather than utilizing a UV lamp um, on, a, on a scanning system or a, an LED pinning unit in a single pass system, here you're able to use some sort of thermal pinning, whether that be a heated air knife, whether that be um, an NIR pinning lamp, an IR uh, pinning lamp, and effectively that will skin the droplets. So that will prevent the spread of the droplets in the same way that you see today with a, with a conventional UV or LED system. So it has a low build. That's one of its main um, advantages over and above uh, what we can see today with, with conventional um, UV products. Um, it has that feel like a gravure or a flexo print, um, which opens up the packaging sector. Its film weight um, between 10 and 30% of a conventional 100% solid UV product. Um, so that offers you a number of benefits. It's odour, as I say, it's a given. When you walk around a supermarket, you don't expect to smell the ink on the package. Um, is very low indeed, um, practically uh, unrecognisable. Its health and safety profile and labelling, uh, we've touched on previously, but you know, it, it's not only around people's safety, but in addition to that, the shipping of the products as well. When we start to talk about some of these, these marketplaces, packaging, for example, um, we're no longer talking about delivering in one and five litre containers. These types of products will be delivered in much larger quantities. So the shipping aspect has to also be considered. And this product will be um, free for shipment with, uh, with any of the major carriers. Um, the colour gamut is extended. So because you've got that thinner film weight, um, you get a much better uh, colour profile with, with these products over conventional UV. Low migration, I spoke a little bit about it last year, um, as I say, it's, it's being accepted in the marketplace today, um, is now out in the marketplace, and this product has the ability to achieve it. So not only does it have the ability to deliver the print performance as a flexor or a gravure press in terms of its actual um, functional aspects, but it will also achieve it in terms of its migration capability. And it has a better environmental profile, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. So if we think back 10, 15 years, the primary ink chemistry in the inkjet world was solvent. So in that case, it had a high level of VOC and a high level of uh, non-renewables. Now we've moved towards UV. Today, UV is an uh, accepted technology uh, which performs well in a number of marketplaces. That product still has high uh, non-renewable content, um, obviously coming from crude oil byproducts, but in addition to that, it has uh, a low VOC. The functional aqueous and aquacure technology has the ability to deliver both. And when we start to define that, um, here we can see that uh, UV is clearly the leader from a VOC, VOC perspective, uh, but functional aqueous is only a, a short distance behind and still significantly better than solvent. And when we take that to the next step, the non-renewable element of it um, you're suddenly making that significant step with functional aqueous of 20 to 30 percent um, is non-renewable within the uh, within this formulation. So the markets, where will it be used? Um, we 
have seen it already in some uh, some graphics applications, and there continues to be development in that space. Um, clearly, the roll-to-roll -roll segment, where you need good flexibility, good durability, um, this product is particularly well suited. Um, but in addition to that, it does also have some functionality on uh, on hybrid hybrid presses and rigid presses as well. So the printer technology arguably exists today with some modification from uh, from a drying perspective. Um, but in addition to that, there is a drive towards better ink chemistry from a legislative perspective in the graphic sector. And this technology has the ability to do that. Then we talk about packaging. This is a big one. You know, Sun Chemical is a packaging ink supplier. And uh, we have to um, deliver chemistry into this sector to ensure that we're well positioned as, as this market develops. And this market um, is starting to happen now. Uh, the presses don't necessarily exist, but the sector is very keen um, for, for digital. I've spent a lot of time with um, leaders in, in this sector, and uh, all of them are taking information in around uh, around digital and are very much looking forward to having the ability to, to deliver it in a uh, what they would consider viable um, format. But the good news is in relation to that, the printheads exist today. The curing units exist today, both UV and thermal. And um, the system integrators uh, and OEMs exist today. So now it really is deliverable. The chemistry exists, and so do every other key component uh, within the, um, the, the, the market. And within the sector, there's always been inkjet in packaging always appears to have had a small compromise. One way or another, there's been a compromise, whether it be odor, whether it be the film weight, whether it be the price. This solution finally gives the ability to deliver the conventional um, performance in terms of uh, its feel and its odor and its um, general behavior on media. Carton and corrugated board is another sector that uh, this particular technology will work well in. Um, this one has a slight advantage in the fact that it has some absorption into the actual media itself. So some of that water component is uh, is absorbed into the media, which gives us a, uh, a good level of um, performance in terms of its uh, drying abilities. It means you can run it with slightly less uh, power, um, and it, it works very well. It has, again, uh, good folding and scuff resistance properties um, through the durability of the product. Um, and again, it comes back to things like odor and film weight, uh, which also prove important in these particular market spaces. So how do we think this system looks? I've kind of touched on it. Um, that there is not dissimilar, really, uh, with the exception of the two red bars, to a conventional um, solvent press in respect to the fact that it's a heated plant so that you've got some heat in the media when you're printing, helps with image quality. Um, then you have some uh, lamps on the side which are effectively um, helping the, uh, the, the curing process, the drying process, um, but again maintaining image quality. Then you go through uh, a drying system here. We use a hot air knife, which is effectively getting to that final point of, um, uh, or, or taking out that, those final few elements of the water component. And then it passes under a full width UV, uh, in this case, which gives you the, uh, the final cured um, material. In regards to that, um, today we talk about uh, many millijoules of, of power and dose and many, many scanning passes. Here we're talking about a single pass, um, maybe in the order of uh, 1 to 200 millijoules. And what would it look like in single pass? We touched on packaging. A scanning system isn't going to work in the packaging world. Um, so in, in relation to that, um, we envisage that you replace what today is typically pinned with, a, with an LED system, uh, with some sort of uh, IR or NIR system, uh, and then passes through a dryer. Um, in that case, there's going to be an extraction. Uh, we do have a small amount of VOC. We're going to have also a lot of water vapor. You've got to remember it's 60 to 90 percent of the formulation that you're evaporating off. Um, that will need to be uh, caught and dealt with. Um, but the majority of the packaging converters out there today uh, have those types of systems already installed. Then you hit it with UV, as we say here. Sort of less than 200 millijoules is our expectation, but obviously the line speed will have a uh, have an effect on that. So, what do the drying arrangements look like? Well, for us, you know, it's 
IR, NIR. You've got people like Abfoss, IST, Horaeus, Honway. Many, many players out in the marketplace who are able to deliver these types of systems. And then um, from a uh, UV perspective, e-beam perspective, um, again, there are many different types of systems that can be utilized. Uh, only very recently have we done some work around, uh, around e-beam, for example, and demonstrated that this technology can also be delivered with, uh, with that curing device. That's particularly interesting because certain uh, packaging uh, companies have a, uh, a route which has been established over many years which focuses on e-beam. Um, so therefore, that really opens up, again, the packaging sector entirely to, uh, to this type of chemistry. So, when's it available? Um, the answer is that the chemistry is available now. Uh, the development work is done. Um, the print heads are available today. Um, you know, we've seen presentations from, from Seiko, um, but also you know, Rico, uh, Dynamatic, Samba print heads, um, all have capability in, uh, in this specific area to, uh, to manage the water uh, component. The drying techniques are on the marketplace today. Um, clearly, they will need to be integrated and optimized for this particular solution, but they can do it. We proved they can do it in a laboratory scale, and we've also um, proved it in some, uh, some early press developments. Um, the architecture exists today already in, uh, in the graphic sector. Uh, we're talking about small change to something which, which already exists. And in the narrow web sector, what we're seeing last, you know, from last week onwards, really, is the continual improvement in terms of image quality, in terms of speed, and um, scalable systems, which will allow print widths to, to grow and to start to deliver to, to flexible packaging. Um, the, the inks are optimized for either system. So if we are told exactly which system um, it is, which print head it is, we can optimize it to any, any given technology. And the target markets in the digital space for this product have always said, we would like to print with water-based inks. And we believe that this is the first time that that will actually be deliverable. So given all of that, um, from, uh, to allow me to take a breath, is there any questions? Thank you very much. Perhaps the first question from Jan uh, Vilhoek. Just a question, is this uh, product uh, comparable with what uh, Durst was demonstrating uh, last summer in uh, Cologne on his water-based inkjet? UV water-based uh, inkjet demonstration. It was a white format machine running the same type of ink that you are explaining now. Uh, it gives me the impression that they were working with your uh, laboratory ink or so. Right. Um, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to comment in relation to the partners that we've been working with. Um, but uh, there, there are a number of uh, significant equipment manufacturers that we've been working with on this type of technology for some time, which gives us the confidence to be able to come here and talk to you about it. So um, this isn't just based on laboratory uh, work. This has been uh, proven in um, applications and uh, in specific market spaces. I can't comment on who we're working with, I'm afraid. I see another hand there. For a question? Yes. Mr. Partridge. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Partridge from the Four Links. Um, just wondered, Richard, if you could say um, you mentioned that you require IR or NIR penny. Yes. Um, in the packaging industry, when we were working with flexible packaging substrates, a lot of them are extremely heat sensitive. Yeah. Um, so what sort of substrate temperatures are you expecting to produce or, or that are necessary for thermally pinning the ink and then, and then drying it thoroughly before you get to the UV cure? Yeah, in terms of... Um uh, the media itself, uh, typically we're talking about 50 to 55 degrees C, um, that sort of range. Um, 
typically that is manageable in a number of the, the spaces. But I, I also take your point that in relation to some of the very uh, thin film uh, materials, uh, that can still prove difficult. Um, but obviously, when you start to look at NIR type technology, where uh, effectively you're reducing the amount of heat which is received by the media itself, um, you have some, some additional potential in that space. Any other questions? That's right. Uh, just uh, intuitively, I was thinking maybe the aqueous based version may be cheaper, but the polymer components and so on may counterbalance that. Can you comment on that? In terms of um, pricing expectations, it's certainly um, our feeling that this product will be cheaper than a 100% UV solution. Um, and as I mentioned, from a, uh, a packaging perspective, uh, UV in some respects has been prohibitive. Uh, we don't envisage that this technology will be. So um, we definitely see that there will be cost benefits and there will not be a significant trade-off in terms of the UV component versus the water component. Well, perhaps a, a last question from my side. Yes. Do you have already a pilot site or some uh, integration for those kind of things with IR or e beam or and, and jetting? Yeah, I mean, we have some uh, some work that um, equipment within uh, SunJet ourselves. Um, in addition to that, we're working with a number of um, equipment manufacturers to develop solutions, um, which uh, are at various stages of their development right now. Um, but for sure, we expect that uh, the first installs uh, with this technology will take place within this year. Um, predominantly in the graphic space. And then next year, we'll see further equipment launches and um, uh, uh, market, uh, market adoption of this technology. Uh, we expect it to be you know, fully, fully accepted, if you like, in sort of a time frame of 2017, approximately. So we will see prototypes at Drupal then? I would expect you will, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Richard.